All right, today our top fails using PAR meter, specifically it's Apogee one. Mm -hmm. uh, we've made all kinds of mistakes and you can learn from ours so you don't have to experience them yourself. All right, so number one, this thing's 500 bucks and you may only use it once. Uh, not so many what he wants to do. Yeah, so the mistake is buying one of these when you know, there's rentals out there. We have rentals for a fraction of the cost and you just don't have to buy one. Over the last couple of years, it's become pretty darn evident. Uh, one of the biggest failure points of setting up your LEDs is we buy all these super advanced tools and then we just wing it and hope for the best. <laughs> Flip some switches and like hope that these corals like adapt to the new environment that we set up, even though it might be half the amount of energy that they get wild in the wild or a quadruple, who knows? <laughs> uh, and what looks good to the eye often is let's, let's make it super bright and going too much par is often the biggest problem. Mm. So, uh, uh, the flip side of that is who wants to buy a $500 meter that you're gonna use one time? And I say one time because you should. You should set it up and forget it. That is the best possible thing you can do for the animals that you care for. Uh, it's not a toy. Don't just flip mm -hmm. it around, change all the colors all the time, go for disco effects. It's just uh, <laughs> silly. Set it up one time, get it right the first time. And so in this case, we brought in the PAR meter rental program so that you can rent one, uh, set it up right, probably only takes you an hour to do, uh, and then Send it back because you don't need this thing collecting dust and you can spend your under 400 bucks plus on something else you want. All right, so number two, the inverse of that. Which is the making the mistake of renting one when you should actually buy one. And there's a few instances uh, where you probably would want to buy one. I'd say, you know, you're like an aquaculture facility, mm -hmm. you know, you're super advanced, every last little tweak, you know, produces some kind of economic effect for you. Uh, swapping frags yeah. in and out of a frag system all the time. Yeah, you got a big advanced frag system, or you got, you know, 10, 20 grand in coral in there, and you're just like on the bleeding edge, you know, and like some of these corals do actually do like dramatically different coloration and growth mm -hmm. patterns in 200 par versus 300 par and you really want to like document it and test it yeah. see how it does for two months document it test it again so just total bleeding edge <laughs> of uh, coral growth this is like the end of the hobby all right well now owning a tool like this you can do that all the time with makes total sense but between the two one of these probably rang true to you and you can figure out which one is the right one but for one thing is for sure you know, just buying the LEDs and flipping switches and hoping for the best has the lowest percentage path to success. Number three, the eyeball is a terrible measuring tool. <laughs> yeah, so don't make the mistake of just thinking, oh, this is bright enough uh, or dim, too dim, so I'm gonna flip the switches and I think that's what my corals need because your eye is not this tool. Yeah, so one of those things you'll recognize right away is A, the eye represents uh, or perceives green as actually brightness mm. uh, for the most part. Uh, and one of the things you'll see also is like if you put in like an atinic bulb or you put in like an ATI blue plus bulb, you say, oh it looks man. Looks dim. Yeah, it looks really dim. There's way less par at that atinic bulb. Reality, 25% less. Even though it looks like maybe four times brighter it's only 25% difference. Yeah. The human eye is just terrible at rep representing even brightness because it like auto irises, uh, but it has no ability to measure photosynthetic radiation, all right? So <laughs> it has no ability to measure that at all. So just know that for sure. The human eye is a terrible, terrible tool to uh, measure PAR. Some people that have been doing this for 15 years know the difference and know the spectrums and know what those brightness look like in that spectrum. So only that level of experience will allow you to do that type of thing. All right, so sometimes 500 bucks is actually more. Yeah, so don't make the mistake of getting your PAR meter. Uh, they come with the rentals, but this wand is the best tool that you can use for the PAR meter because your hand gets in the way or, you know, it's hard to kind of like get this around while you've got your meter right here and trying to write notes at the same time. The wand will just get you there. You know, even when you're doing it as a two-person job, like, uh, I don't want to put my arm in there and do all that stuff. I, like Randy's writing down the numbers, he's got the par meter, I'm shooting it around. Works way, way better. So with the rental, uh, it actually just comes with it. So, you know, you don't have to worry about it. But if you're going to buy the meter, uh, either buy the wand or figure out a DIY solution so you don't have to put your arm in there and wiggle around and try to do this and write down the results all at the same time. All right, so number five, 
you know, there is a right tool for a right job here, and uh, you should really actually think about it. Yeah, so don't overlook or make the mistake of overlooking the other options other than this handheld version. They do have a Bluetooth one, so you can monitor on your phone or your PC. I think some of it has some logging data capabilities as well, but you know, which one is right for you? Am I gonna sit there and handhold one and scribble, or can I let my phone or my uh, PC do the work? So if you're gonna buy one, uh, and you're only gonna use it sometimes, like you're somewhere in between that I'm gonna use it one time mm -hmm. and I'm gonna use it 500 times, uh, then the PC and the Bluetooth options work pretty well because you know my phone isn't all that different than this meter. Uh, it's a little bit more wonky to open up the app and connect it and all that kind of stuff, but not really that much. Mm -hmm. And then if I can just bring a laptop or something to the tank, plug in the USB and go to town, uh, that's also a legit option and those things are way like half the cost here. However, sometimes uh, a thing that's just designed to do what it does is actually way more convenient. So if you are on the scope of the bleeding edge and I use this thing all the time, being able to simply pick it up and have it always work and not go through menu systems, not have it like mm. constantly going to sleep or uh, people calling and texting me on it or whatever, <laughs> I, I, this actually makes it a lot you know, easier to use if you're gonna use it all the time. Number six, you can chase your tail on this one if you want, but yeah. I don't think so. Yeah, we get this question all the time. So don't make the mistake of just waiting for the numbers to settle on one specific number. It's just not gonna happen. It's kind of a rolling window. It's constantly taking measurements. They change, you know, because of the uh, the refraction of the top of the water. They change here and there based on how much you move just incrementally. Uh, so just in your mind average what it's showing. Yeah, so here's the secret. If you don't have 162, everything's dead. No, <laughs> that's, that's totally true. fake. Yeah, so if that was the case, then we nobody would ever be successful. So the only goal here is actually to be probably within like 50 points of any specific mm -hmm. range. And you can probably even be far outside of that. But if you're within 50 points of the goal, man, you are doing better than 99% of the reefers out there. Uh, and like lighting will not be the reason that you're not successful. So don't get super hung up on if it's going up or down 10 or 20 points. Just, uh, you know, pick a range and, you know, get a, ga a guess and just move on. All right, so number seven, I hear this all the time. You know, should I do it with the flow on or off? Mm. Because, you know, the corals are experiencing the fluctuations with the coral, uh, with the flow on and all the ripples. So isn't that right? Yeah, so that is the mistake is uh, not turning your flow off. Uh, you can test the, like you said, it's probably a difference of 50 par when it's jumping up and down with the flow or without the flow. You'll actually get a, a tighter window, an easier to read window with the flow off because the ripples aren't changing it dr drastically. So just measure with your power heads off. To, depending on how much flow you actually have and how much surface tension, the uh, edges of the essentially little waves will actually refract it. And it might not even be 50, it could be 200, yeah. you know, 100, 300, 100, 300, be all over the place. Uh, when you turn it off, essentially you're gonna create like a average. Mm -hmm. You know, it'll be right in the middle, it'll probably be like 200 in this case. So uh, I would say do it without the flow. It's way easier to get a, you know, effective reading. And then just know when you turn the flow on, it'll kind of, you know, be in a window around there. All right, number eight, not all the flow. Yeah, so don't make the mistake of turning your return pump off. Instead, it's not a matter of the ripples on this one. It's a matter of the water level and the drop and then the penetration of the par with less water. Yeah, so a lot of us, when you turn it off, it'll drop an inch or two, and that will definitely mm. affect uh, the PAR numbers in there. So one of the things that I would say, though, is turn the return pump uh, nozzles down so they're not creating a lot of ripples. But for me, personally, I would definitely leave the returns on so that the water level is normal and I get a more effective reading. Number nine, we kind of hit on this already, but I want to really drill it home. Yeah, the mistake is thinking that you need to be absolutely correct rather than more of a ballpark average because that's really what it's all about. Yeah, so the goal here is actually not to make sure that you have exactly like 162, it's to make sure you don't have 1600. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and again, the human eye really can't pick that up. And so the 
you really want to just make sure you're close. So if mm. you're getting hung up on 50 par one or the, one way or the other, you're probably getting a little mad scientist with your par. Or again, you're like on the bleeding edge and you think you found some uh, magical thing. Uh, if you do, share it with us because I'd love to know. <laughs> but uh, for the most part, for most people just looking to have a successful tank, uh, make sure that you're not chasing numbers. Just make sure you're in the ballpark. All right, so number 10, usually we get to promote uh, Randy's investigates because he does all that Austin work, but this time, me. Yeah, so don't overlook or miss Ryan's videos on the par meter. There's two of there's two series here, there's two videos here. One is the par meter, and it'll tell you everything you need to know about how to use it and goals. The second one is mastering par with a higher level of what you should even be looking for. Yeah, so if you want to nerd out on par, there's like 30 minutes of like why we came up with the par meter yeah. or the par ranges that you're looking for. So go check out Mastering Par. But really, if you're just looking for the direct information, in 10 minutes mastering your par meter and how to use it, mm. 10 minutes you can figure out exactly how to use this uh, next level stuff that a lot of people haven't really considered. So I'd go check out that right here, which is Mastering Your Par Meter. But if you just want to go rent one of these right now, go ahead and check it out right here.